lift you up, to worship you, to glorify and exalt you. Father, be with this service now in everything we do and say. And especially, Father, later on as we come to the Lord's Supper, help us to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. For it's in his name we pray. Safar, 
wrong again? No, I don't know. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm scared to death to say his name because I always say it wrong. Anyway, Amir is going to be uh, interviewed by Alan, and uh, they're going to talk about Israel in end time prophecy. And what is fascinating about this video is at the very beginning, Alan says, Well, Amir, I know that you were born and raised in Israel. How did you become a Christian? And he gives his testimony. And I had never heard his testimony before. It is powerful. Very, very powerful. And then he asks Amir, well, where does Israel even fit into Bible prophecy? And Amir just, it just rolls out of him. This whole prophetic scenario is absolutely fantastic. So I encourage you to come tonight. It's really a, a very, very good interview. And so that's what's tonight. All right. I uh, want to remind you about the church library. we got some more books that were donated this last week. Some very excellent books. So please come and check it out. Then uh, we want to remind you that the coin jar <coughs> is for Operation Christmas Child right now. And for the shipping costs, so far $240 has come in. And again, we have through November. But again, it's a little bit at a time as it comes in, it builds up. Remember, uh, Samaritan's Purse takes these boxes they ship them all over around the world, and uh, it costs them to do that. And so uh, it's a big help to them if we can help supply some of the funds to ship. So that's what our coin jar is all about. Speaking of Operation Christmas Child, on Thursday mornings, the ladies are getting together at 10 o'clock down in the fellowship hall, and so far they've still been sorting things. They're trying to get all everything ready. So that when it's time to actually pack these boxes, you can just go through in an assembly line. So uh, if you're free, come and help them out on Thursday mornings. And then the men have been getting together at 11, and uh, we have a good time of fellowship in my office. So gentlemen, if you want to take an early lunch, come and join us. All right. The church picnic is coming up. And I just wanted to remind you that it's not only Sunday, July 24th, but it is at Wildwood Park. And again, some of you keep saying, where is Wildwood Park? Well, if you go north on Division, and it's on the north side of Mill Creek, it's a smaller park, very beautiful. They have a, a, a nice covered area, uh, kitchen area. They have bathrooms. They have uh, play equipment for the kids, a nice parking lot. The church is going to bring fried chicken. Now, you don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to fry it. Buy it every year. We bring the fried chicken. <clears throat> and we're also going to be bringing uh, some things like paper plates and napkins and things. So, what you need to bring, first of all, is yourself. Number two, bring somebody with you. And then bring a hot dish, salad, or dessert and your own beverages. We're not going to be providing big punch bowls or anything like that. So, uh, but anyway, the, the main chicken we provide, so just things like salads and all different sort of side dishes that go with that. As we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we really need to be praying for Israel right now. Uh, things politically are really topsy turvy. And if you know that the Israeli government fell apart, and that's because in Israel they depend upon a coalition to keep their parliament running. And whoever has the coalition with the most votes or enough votes. Uh, gets to have the Prime Minister. Well, that fell apart. And so the current Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, not only left as Prime Minister, but he is now resigning from politics altogether. So there is an interim Prime Minister, and uh, this is part of a free agreement, until this fall when they're going to have elections. This is like their fifth election in the last two or three years. There is a possibility, and only a possibility, that Benjamin Netanyahu, who has been the Prime Minister for many years, who is a conservative, could end up back in office. Uh, many Israeli Christians have been very, very unhappy and very concerned about what has happened in Israel during this last year, as a very liberal wing took over. And uh, anyway, so we need to be praying for Israel during this period of time. When it comes to Alliance for Request, you'll notice some requests there from Spain. You might say, Spain, that's part of Europe. Why do we need to have workers in Spain? Well, most of Europe now lives in a post-Christian era. Very, very few evangelical Christians in Europe. And 
And so God is doing some tremendous work, and we'll take, see about some uh, historic coordination and licensing this ceremony. And God is raising up leaders in Spain in order to help with the national church there. So please be praying for that situation. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing in Israel. And Father, we realize that uh, politics are hard to understand. Politics are hard to understand in our own country, let alone in a foreign country. But Father, we realize that there's political results. And so, Father, the current Israeli government has ceased. Uh, there's an interim prime minister. Uh, new elections will be held. Again, we pray that your will would be done. Father, we believe you're preparing that people for the return of their Messiah. We realize that there's going to be some hard times ahead. But in the meantime, Father, we pray to you bring your people back. And when they come back, they will hear the, the gospel. And then, Father, we would pray for our alliance um, workers around the world today, especially in Spain. Father, we thank you for the good things that are happening there and that national leaders are being raised up in Spain. Father, we just pray that the Spanish people will be open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be with us now, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, please get them up. We are going to be in the book of Exodus again this morning. And uh, the reason that we're in the book of Exodus this morning is that last week we were in the book of Exodus. And the previous week we were in the book of Exodus. The reason that we are in Exodus chapter 29 is that last week we were in Exodus chapter 28. So we're trying to work our way through as we go through the book of Exodus. So, um, again, as we go through this passage of Scripture, and we're going to briefly go over the actual verses in chapter 29, you might say, well, that's interesting, but how does that uh, apply to us today? And so that's what we're going to talk about in the second half of the message is how this applies to us as believers today. So this morning we're going to talk about consecration. Now, many years ago, I heard a very clear and precise definition of what a consecrated Christian is. A consecrated Christian is anyone who would give up a nice, soft bed to come and sleep on a hard wooden pew. That's consecration. <laughs> now you understand. As we've been going through the tabernacle, remember God is giving Moses instructions to the tabernacle. Remember, this is basically a big tent that they would transport through the wilderness with them. We talked about the furniture. We talked about the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and how Jesus is our mercy seat because of his shed blood. We talked about leaving the most holy place and moving out into the holy place. We talked about the table of the showbread and how Jesus is the bread of life. We talked about the lampstand, how Jesus is the light of the world. Then we moved out of the tent into the courtyard. We talked about the altar burnt offering. We talked about how Jesus is our sacrifice once and for all. We talked about the courtyard itself and the fact that there's only one way in and one way out. And the only place that the people of Israel could meet God was in the tabernacle. So they had to come to the tabernacle and they had to go through the one entrance. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We talked about then things like the anointing oil and how the anointing oil represents the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about the garb that they were supposed to create uh, for the, the high priest. And we talked about the fact that you and I now are clothed not with a high priestly gown, but in the righteousness of Christ. And how when Christ sees us, uh, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus Christ. So now, as they get all these things together, they still have to actually consecrate these priests. They actually have to set them aside for their ministry. And this is going to be Aaron and his sons. So again, there is no tabernacle today. There is no temple today. Aaron and his sons are not active today. So how does that apply to us? 
So we're going to have, as our key verses this morning, verses that are not in the, the, the book of Exodus. We're going to be talking about sanctification when we come to New Testament believers. And you might say, wait a minute, you talked about consecration, now you're talking about sanctification. Well, well what are they? Well, have you ever picked up a coin? Uh, some of us still have coins in our pockets. And if you take a look at the coin, on one side there's a head, and one side there's a tail. Or you might say there's the obverse and the reverse, I guess, of the coin. Well, when it comes to this whole issue this morning, I believe that consecration and sanctification are kind of like two sides of the same coin. They're very, very much related. They're slightly different, but they're very much related. So we're going to talk about that this morning. So our key verses come from Romans. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says this, I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So the point that we're going to make this morning is this. As Aaron and his sons were consecrated to God, we as believers should be sanctified today. Our lives need to be set apart for God. We're going to talk about that. So the question that I need to ask myself is, is my life set apart for the glory of God? Aaron and his sons were different. Yes, they were Israelites. They were part of the, the 12 tribes. But yet they were set apart. They had a specific calling, a specific ministry. They were priests. Remember what we said as we've been going through this study together? How come there's no priest today? Well, again, go home and look in the mirror. You and I, as believers, are priests. We're called to a royal priesthood. We're going to see that later in Scripture. All right? So we're different, but yet we are somewhat the same. So two things we're going to talk about this morning. The consecration of Israelite priests and then the sanctification of believing priests. First of all, the consecration of Israelite priests. In Exodus chapter 29, and again, we're going to go through a lot of these verses quite quickly. And I hope you don't have a weak stomach. Because these are a little bit gory. You know, I am so thankful that we don't have a consecration ceremony like this today. Nowadays, we have, for some of us, what is called ordination. Now, I realize ordination is just a, a human, uh, societal sort of thing. It's really not a part of Scripture. But the way that we set apart certain individuals today is to go through ordination. I'm thankful that when I was ordained, and I was done right here in this church, they laid hands on me. The only problem was some of those hands were around my neck. And they were squeezing kind of tight. But anyway, I survived ordination. All right. But I'm glad that I didn't have to go through what Aaron and his sons went through. And again, since today we believe in the priesthood of all believers, I'm thankful that all of us don't have to go through what we're going to describe here quickly, briefly, this morning. All right, verse 1. Now, this is the thing that you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, and unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and you shall make them a wheat flour. You shall put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. Verse 4. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting, and wash them with water. Verse 5. You shall take the garments and clothe Aaron with the tunic and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. So, so far what we're seeing here is that Aaron's brought to the tabernacle, washed. And by the way, why did he have to be washed? Well, it had nothing to do with the fact that he was dirty. Okay, This was ceremonial. This was a ceremonial thing. Aaron and his sons were sinners just like you and me. And because
because we have sinned, we all need God's forgiveness. We all need his cleansing. So here in front of everybody, they wash them to demonstrate that they are sinners just like everybody else. And then they start clothing them with what we talked about last week. You should take the garments and clothe the earth with the tunic and the robe of the ephod. Did I just read that? Let's go to verse 7. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put their headbands on them. And the priest's office there shall be theirs for a perpetual state. Thus you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. So again, remember in just a minute when we switch gears and go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Aaron and his sons were consecrated for life. They were called of God. When we come to the New Testament, you and I are called to be priests of God. And it's a lifelong calling. It's a vocation that we're all supposed to live out. Verse 10. You shall bring a bull before the ten of meetings, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the bull. You shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the ten of meetings. You shall take the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. You shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull is skin and it's dung. You shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. You shall also take one ram, and Aaron the son shall put their hands on the head of the ram. You shall slay the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it around the altar. You shall cut the ram in pieces, and wash its entrails and its legs, and put them on the pieces and its head. You shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a soothing aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the other ram, and Aaron his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram. You shall kill the ram, and take some of the blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, and on the thumb of their right hand, and the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood around the altar. You shall take some of the blood that is on the altar, and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron, and on his garments, and on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. So he and his garments shall be consecrated, along with his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Are you following any of this? I'm sure glad we don't have to go through this today. I mean, here they are in front of all of Israel, and the Aaron and his sons, they have to put their hands, we're going to talk about what that means in a minute, on the heads of these animals. They have to look them in the eye and realize these animals are going to be killed and slaughtered because of their sin. And then they spread this blood everywhere, and they, they burn these animals up. And they take blood and they actually put it on Aaron and their, his sons. It is a bloody thing. But what is this thing about mixing the blood and the oil? Well, Charles Spurgeon has something very interesting to say about that. He says, yes, brother, we need to know that double anointing, the blood of Jesus which cleanses, and the oil of the Holy Spirit which perfumes us. It is well to see how these two blend in one. It is a terrible blunder to set the blood and the oil in opposition. They must always go together. So again, all these things that were going on were symbolic. And so if we understand what Spurgeon is saying here, is that when they took this and they mixed the blood and the oil and they anointed Aaron and his sons with both, you have the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sins, but you have the oil of the Holy Spirit that anoints us for, for service and empowers us for service. So all these things are in some way, shape, or form pointing forward to what God wants to do in our lives. Verse 22. You should also take the fat and the rump of the ram, and the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, and the right 
right shoulder, for it is a ram of consecration, and one loaf of bread, and one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all of these in the hands of Aaron and the hands of his sons, and shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take from their hands and burn them on the altar for a burnt offering. For it is soothing aroma before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire to the Lord. So this which represents the first fruit of their harvest, the first fruit of their food, they're to take all of this and they're to wave it before God and say, God, this is yours, and then burn it. If it's burnt, it's no good. You can't eat it after that, can you? It's gone. So they are literally giving this to God as an offering to God. You shall take the breast of Aaron's ram of consecration and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. You shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved in the thigh of the priest's portion that is contributed from the ram of the consecration for that which is from Aaron and from that which is for his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons by a statute forever, for it is a contribution. It shall be a contribution from the children of Israel for their peace offerings, their contributions to the Lord. The holy garments belonging to Aaron are to belong to his sons after him, so that they may be anointed in them and be consecrated in them. The son that is the priest in his said, said shall put them on seven days, when he comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. So, I want you to get this picture because I think Charles Spurgeon really explains this. Note that these garments were provided for them. They were at no expense in buying them, no labor in weaving them, no skill in making them. They said simply to put them on. And you, dear child of God, are to put on the garments that Jesus Christ has provided you at his own cost and freely bestows upon you out of boundless love. There are so many people today that are involved in religion. And they think that they need to stand before God dressed in their own righteousness. They think by their own good deeds, by their own works, by their own religiosity, Somehow, when they look, when God looks at them, God will see a righteous person. What does the Old Testament tell us? Our righteousness is what? As filthy rags. So what Spurgeon is saying here is just as Aaron and his sons and their sons after them and their sons after them inherited this clothing, and they all had to go through these rites of consecration. This is nothing they made. It's not something they went out and bought. It was provided for them. So you and I today, when we stand before the Lord, we stand dressed in the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see us, he sees Christ. It's not something we can earn, it's not something we can buy. Jesus has already bought it for us through his shed blood. Something important to remember. All right, verse 31. You shall take the ram of the consecration and boil its flesh in a holy place. Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things by which the atonement was made in order to consecrate and sanctify them. But no one shall eat them because they are holy. If any of the flesh of the consecration or the bread remain until morning, then you shall burn the remainder of the fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. The Lord's part, according to Spurgeon, was consumed with fire upon the altar, and another portion was eaten by man in the holy place. The peace offering was thus an open declaration of the communion, which they had then established between God and man. So they ate together, rejoicing in the same offering. Part of it during the sun's age, Part of it was placed on the altar and burned. It was almost as if they were sharing this meal together. And again, in, in the Old Testament times, especially in the Middle East, if you wanted to have peace with somebody, you shared a meal with them. They shared a meal together. <clears throat> Today, 
In just a few minutes, we're going to come to the Lord's Supper. And I am so thankful that at the Lord's Supper, we have unleavened bread and we have grape juice. We don't have to go out and kill an animal. We don't have to shed his blood like they did because Jesus has already shed his blood for us. All right. Every day you must offer a bowl as a sin offering for atonement, and you must cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it. You must anoint it to consecrate it. For seven days you must make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and then the altar will be most holy, and whoever touches the altar will be holy. Over and over again, they had to shed the blood of animals. Go to the book of Hebrews. How often does Jesus Christ need to die for our sins now? Never more. Once was enough. Once was enough. All right, so that's the consecration of, um, of uh, Israelite priests. Let's take a look now at the consecrate or the sanctification. Of, uh, of New Testament believers. And I don't know what happened. Here it is. All of a sudden, my screen disappeared. All right, the sanctification of believing priests. There are two Hebrew words translated consecration in the Old Testament. One appears seven times and means installation, usually of a priest. The other one is only translated consecration twice. Once where it refers to the high priest's crown, and the other in connection with the Nazarite vow of separation. It's translated crown or separation 22 other times. Now the only form of the word, English word to consecrate that can be found in the New Testament is consecrated, where it appears twice. In Hebrews 7.28, it comes from a Greek word that means to be perfect and refers to the Lord. And its form of the same word can be translated, it is finished, in John chapter 19, verse 30. In Hebrews 10, 20, it comes from a different Greek word and means to dedicate and refers to the way in the Holy of Holies the Lord's death created for us. Putting the two together, you could say the Lord Lord's death consecrated us by making us perfect in his sight, and this opened the way into the Holy of Holies for us. So, consecration is not a word that is really used often in the New Testament. So what is the word that is used in the New Testament? Well, it is sanctification. The Greek word for sanctification appears ten times in the New Testament, although it can mean consecration. It never translated that way. It is used to mean sanctification five times and holiness five times. The root word means holy, so it means sanctified to be holy or set apart. So they consecrated Aaron and his sons. But you and I, in a sense, have already been consecrated through the blood of Christ. So now we need to be sanctified, set apart. It is a process that God works out in our life to make us holy. So, remember what the fourfold gospel is of the Christian and Missionary Alliance? Jesus Christ, our Savior, our what? Sanctifier, healer, and coming king. That's one of the things that 80 cents in the Alliance uh, emphasized very early. It's one thing for us to say, I'm saved. I know my sins are forgiven. But it's another thing to start living for the Lord, to living in the power of His Spirit, to be set apart for Him. That is sanctification. Well, why would we want to be sanctified? Why would we want to be set apart? Well, you and I are priests. Just like Aaron and his sons were priests in the Old Testament, you and I as believers are called to be priests today. Now, I know there are some religious groups that have priests, and then everybody else are the laity. So you have this religious group, and then you have all these common people. Remember the Protestant Reformation? What was one of the emphases of the Protestant Reformation? The priesthood of all believers. Just because some of us have a title applied to our lives, 
doesn't mean that we are at some spiritual level different than everybody else. All of us as believers are priests before the Lord. Let's go to Scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 2, here's what it says. Therefore, put away all wickedness, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow, by it you may grow, if it is true that you have experienced that the Lord is good. Coming to him as a living stone who is rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house as a what? Holy priesthood. Aaron and his disciples and his sons were priests who were set apart. And so they were a holy priesthood. You and I are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, just as Aaron and his sons offered up sacrifices at the tabernacle. You and I now as priests offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it is also contained in the scripture, Look, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, and a light precious, and he who believes in me shall never be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word to which you have been appointed. But you are a chosen race, what? A royal priesthood. So remember, Aaron and his family weren't elected every year. They didn't go before a committee and said, oh, I guess these people will make them priests. No. no. God chose them. He set them apart. And so by nature, by, by their birth, they were part of the Sarana priesthood. You and I have been born again. We have been born into God's family. We have been adopted into God's family. We are now part of Christ. And because of our lineage, we are now a chosen race. We are now a holy priesthood. A holy nation. A people for God's own possession, so that you may declare the goodness of him who has called you out of darkness into marvelous light. In times past, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but you now you have received mercy. So with this in mind then, Paul, these are our key verses in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, says this. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, again, Paul writing says, Finally, brothers, we urge you and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have learned from us how to, you ought to walk and to please God, you should excel more and more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, this process of being set apart for a holy purpose, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of depravity, even as the Gentiles who do not know God, that no man take advantage of and defraud his brother in any manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all things, as we have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he that despises does not despise man, but God who has given us, also given us the Holy Spirit. And then back in 1 Peter, Peter writing in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but what? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be always ready to give an example, answer to every man who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and fear. So think about this. Peter says, sanctify 
by God in your heart. Aaron and his sons were brought to the tabernacle and outwardly consecrated. They poured water on them, they poured blood on them, they poured oil on them, but they put fancy clothes on them. But that was all external. On the inside, they were still the same old man. But when we come to the New Testament, Jesus not only wants us to be sanctified on the outside, he wants us to be sanctified on the inside. God wants to change our heart. He wants to make us holy people. So in the Old Testament, there were priests. And they went through a process of consecration. But it was all external. In the New Testament. Because Jesus has already consecrated us through his shed blood. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to set us apart. He wants to make us holy, but from the inside out. He wants to change our lives to be the people he wants us to be. So consecration of Israelite priests, sanctification of believing priests. Remember what our key verses were? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect for the will of God. So the point is this. As Aaron and his sons were consecrated to God, so we as believers should be sanctified today. The question is, is my life set apart for the glory of God? I'm not asking you, are you saved? If we're saved, that means our sins are forgiven. We've been born again. We know we're going to, to heaven when we die. We have eternal fire insurance, whatever you want to call it. But sanctification is a process that is working in our life to make us more and more like Jesus. When we're set apart for him, we're filled with his spirit. Now, it ultimately results in glorification. The glorification doesn't happen here. We have to wait until we get new bodies and we're living in the Lord's presence. So, hopefully all of you are saved. You all know Jesus as your Savior. God's forgiven your sins. But as he at work in your life, sanctifying you. Sanctification is a process. Yeah, in a sense, it's a position in that for many of us, we come to a crisis in our life and we have to really make Jesus the Lord of our life and surrender to the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call that. For many of us, it's a natural act of the will. And we have to say, okay, Lord, you take over. But it's a process. We're all in process. We're all hopefully growing to be more like Jesus. But are you letting the Holy Spirit work in your life to make you more like Jesus? That's the whole idea. So there's a difference. There's a difference between the Old Testament. There's a difference between the New Testament. But it's a good difference. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, help us now as we come to your communion table in just a minute. Help us to remember what Jesus did for us. Father, we thank you that in the Old Testament, you had a series of priests who represented the people before God. But Father, we thank you that in the New Testament, since the sacrifice has already been made, now we serve you as priests in a new capacity. Help our lives to be sacrifices of love and honor and worship and service to you. For it's in Jesus' name.
I am so thankful that I don't have to go out and slaughter animals today. Seriously. Again, when you read the few chapters that we've just been going through in Exodus, it is a bloody religion. Now, again, do you realize that when Aaron and his sons place their hands on, on the heads of these animals. It was a serious thing. It wasn't just a touch. It was a, a soft, a solid push. And they're looking at the eyes of this animal, realizing that this animal is going to die. Its blood is going to be shed. Its body is going to be cut to pieces. Most of it's going to be burnt because of their sin. Jesus, when he spent that last night with his disciples, and he celebrated the Last Supper, he was thinking about the Passover lamb. They were all thinking about the Passover lamb. And Jesus, in effect, was saying, I am your Passover lamb. My body is going to be broken for you. My blood is going to be shed for you. But once and for all. We don't have to do that anymore. So what we have here is simply an emblem. It's simply a way of remembering. Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. And so that's why periodically we stop. We change our service. And we do this to remind us who we are and why we're here. We are not here this morning because we're basically good people and we want to do good things and so all these good people get together. No. According to the Bible for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ultimately we are not good people. We're sinners. But we're here because of what Jesus did and because we have appropriated what Jesus has done for us. So the blood, in a sense, is applied to us. And again, he doesn't see our spiritual garb. We don't have fancy outfits that we put on to impress him. When he looks at us today, he sees Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ. So we're going to participate together. Again, these fellowship cups are a way of trying to do things during this period of time. So we're not passing things around where everybody's touching it. So there are two layers. The first is a clear plastic layer. Yeah. And if you pull it back, you'll find a little wafer, which represents the unloved bread, the broken bread, the broken body. So Mark Sutherland, would you first of all ask God's blessing on the bread? Our God and our Father, come before you this morning thankful that we can remember your beloved son, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you allowed man to put your body on the cross. We thank you that you did not call for the twelve legions of angels which could have destroyed the world and set you free. But rather you allowed man to do this wicked deed so we know that so let's partake of this together. During the Passover supper, they had several cups that they would pass. And there were certain words you were supposed to say, certain prayers you were supposed to do. Well, Jesus' disciples were shocked because when Jesus took the cup of redemption, he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. In the Bible it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And you just see this whole consecration service that Aaron and his sons had to go through, there was lots of blood. Blood on the altar. Blood on Aaron and the 
his sons. Blood everywhere. Well, as we participate by bringing this cup, we remember that Jesus, when he died on the cross, shed his blood. But his blood, because he was the eternal Son of God, the sinless Son of God, was able to pay the price. So, Dan, would you ask God's blessing upon the cup this morning? Oh, Father, as we come before you, we come as a people with nothing to offer. Yes, our righteousness is as filthy rags. But because of your great love, and Jesus, because of your love for us and your obedience, you came, and yes, you willingly were hung on a cross. Your side was pierced. Your blood was spilled. That our neediness, our sinful ways might be covered. And we thank you now, Jesus said. Your righteousness covers us and we're seen as clothed with beautiful garments. Thank you for the shedding of your blood. For without it, we would be hopeless and damned forever. In Jesus' name. Shall we partake together? As we come to our first year time, if you have your uh, bulletins, uh, we have a few things that we want to add. Uh, one, Mary just came and talked to me uh, before the service. One of her relatives, Valerie, uh, who has uh, moved down to Costa Rica to go to medical school, uh, has been diagnosed with a very rare lung disease. And so uh, she really needs a touch from the Lord. Uh, luckily, they have good medical care down there. She's a medical student, but uh, she needs our prayers. So that's Valerie. And it's really good to see Debbie Sutherland with us. And you've been praying for her this week. Uh, and she has a kidney stone. And so, you know, her husband gave her a rock probably when they got married. Now she's got another rock. And this rock she wants to get rid of. So pray that she'll be able to get rid of that stone. Uh, Mary Vernon Grant is a friend of Norman Nancy Cox. We've been praying for her. She had a had a cancer tumor on her kidney, did not respond well to chemotherapy, so they actually went in surgically and removed it. She survived that surgery, but now she's dealing with some of the complications of surgery, so please pray for her uh, healing. And Nancy Cox has been going through chemotherapy. It's been very hard on her, but so far they think she's making progress, so continue to be praying for her. I don't really have any updates on uh, the rest of these. So are there any other prayer requests that we need to add to the list or any updates that you want? Like? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love. And Father, we thank you that you are working in the lives of people. And Father, again, for all these that we have listed, we just lift them up to you and pray that you would work and touch each and every life in such a way that Jesus would be glorified. Father, we thank you that Jesus is not only concerned about our spiritual needs, he's concerned about our practical needs as well. And Father, we know that when Jesus was alive, many were brought to him for physical healing. And so, Father, we look to you today that you would touch lives in such a way that Jesus would be glorified. It's in his name we ask these things.
is far from perfect is still free. That we can gather together as believers in Jesus and still be able to worship you and praise you and glorify you and study your word. And so, Father, tomorrow as our nation celebrates its Independence Day, help us to be thankful for those who have gone before us, be thankful for what has been provided for us, and then, Father, help us as believers to stand up for what is right in our nation so that we as a nation may be true to you and your word until Jesus comes. Be with us now, we pray. And all of God's people said...